Our news is brought to you by Alive. Believe in best. Good evening, Bahamas. Coming up in our news tonight, a huge fire at Balfour Avenue leaves families homeless. An active hurricane season is expected this year. How you should start preparing now. Three women change the way you look at a male-dominated field. A business in Eleuthera is buzzing in a sweet way. And renewable energy is on the way to East Grand Bahama. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. I'm Georgie O'Bain, topping news tonight. The Bahamas passing a grim milestone as 209 COVID-19 related deaths have been confirmed since the start of the pandemic. According to the Ministry of Health, six deaths previously under investigation are now confirmed as COVID-19 related deaths. 30 new cases were recorded in the country yesterday. 23 cases on New Providence, four on Grand Bahama, one on Eleuthera and two on Exuma. For a full breakdown, visit the R News Facebook page. Firefighters rushed to tackle the major blaze that left several families homeless tonight. All this unfolding as residents lined the street in disbelief. Greg Bullard heard his sister screaming, fire, fire. When he walked outside, Bullard saw a utility pole had caught on fire and flames were destroying his neighbor's homes. His biggest fear was that the blaze would eventually spread to his family's home just across the street. Sad is so sad. Come out and see. I mean, I know the house is all my life and the persons who live across there. Even the last, the, the, the latest through the rows, you know, it's strange. I mean, it's unreal. It's hard. Just like two set of family live in the house there. So that's a three, that's five persons there. I think three here, and I put about, about five, another five in the house over there. So. Any kids in any of these houses? Children live in the house there. And there's a young boy that, in the house there. That's it. The other has adults. Older lady, a 95, 96 year old lady across the street here. Press liaison officer Audley Peters giving brief details on the scene as the investigation into what caused the fire is still underway. Peters confirming that an elderly woman was taken to the hospital for fire related injuries. The fire department received reports of a structural fire that occurred on Jenny Street. The units responded and on their arrival they met three structures engulfed in flame. The officers began to tackle the fire and moments later two other additional units came to assist with extinguishing the flames. As it stands, we understand that there are 10 structures that were affected, six of them were destroyed and four was partially destroyed. A 99-year-old female was taken to the hospital as a result of treat for treatment as a result of flame, uh, the smoke inhalations. Member of Parliament for Anglerson, Glennis Hannah Martin, and the PLP's candidate for the area were on the ground with residents as they vowed to assist families in the aftermath of the blaze. This is a, a very, very sad, sad day to day. However, though, when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. We will assist the people in this community to get back on their feet. And we ask the public to, to stand with us and to help the people in this yes. moment. The residents are very hurt. And I feel their pain, especially in this time, the pandemic time, when many persons have lost their jobs, um, people are financially strapped. And so I'm happy to know that I came on board and my colleagues and I, that we're gonna see what we can do to assist these persons. On the month ahead of the start of the Atlantic hurricane season, the Ministry of Disaster Preparedness Management and Reconstruction hosting a press conference on hurricane preparedness. Our Christina Dragovich gives us the details. Director of Meteorology Trevor Baston says forecasters agree the upcoming hurricane season will be above average, placing the Bahamas and the region at risk. We're looking for our region to have favorable conditions for development. And while the official dates of the hurricane season remain the same from June 1st to November 30th, tropical weather outlooks will be issued as necessary beginning May 15th. Colorado State University has predicted 17 named storms, eight hurricanes and four major hurricanes this season. This comes on the heels of what forecasters say was a record breaking season in 2020. We had 30 named storms of which six developed into hurricanes, uh, sorry, 13 developed into hurricanes, 
and six into major hurricanes. After that busy hurricane season, members of the 2021 Hurricane Committee retired the names Dorian and Laura and replaced them with Dexter and Leah, as well as the names Etta and Iota. These names were not replaced as the Greek alphabet was completely withdrawn from use. Hurricane preparedness must become a part of our way of life. We must have our family plans, evacuation plans, community plans, business continuity plans and sector plans all ready to put into action if it becomes necessary. National Emergency Management Agency Director Captain Stephen Russell says the time to prepare is now. This as the Ministry of Disaster Preparedness and Reconstruction marks Disaster Preparedness Month in May, a move to encourage residents to start preparing for an emergency as early as possible under the theme, We Are All NEMA Stronger Than Ever. Reporting for our news, I'm Christina Dragovich. A man is dead and two others are injured following a shooting on Palima Street Saturday night. Officers and emergency personnel were called to the scene where they discovered the three injured men. A small vehicle traveled through the, through the streets where, three, where a group of males were congregated. An occupant of that vehicle discharged a firearm in their direction, hitting the victims. Emergency medical services were summoned met there on their arrival. The victims were treated. However, one of the males succumbed to his injuries on scene. Two of the males were transported to the hospital via the ambulance, one of which his condition is critical and the other is stable. According to press liaison Audley Peters, the victims of the latest shooting incident are believed to be between the ages of 35 and 60 and were attending a gathering when shots were fired. Police are encouraging members of the public to use better conflict resolution skills. We want to encourage members of the public, and particularly our men, to find alternative solutions in resolving their conflict and to be aware that life is valuable. We're appealing to members of the public who may have any information with regard to this incident to contact the Criminal Investigations Department or their nearest police station to provide that information to us. The number at the Criminal Investigation is 502 9991 or 919. And of the 59 bodies recovered on Abaco following Hurricane Dorian, drowning was likely the cause of death for nearly half of them, according to senior pathologist at Princess Market Hospital. Jared Higgs tells us more. While testifying before the Hurricane Dorian inquest, Dr. Kiko Bridgewater said that a pathology team comprising of himself, a senior pathologist, several junior doctors and mortuary staff traveled to Marsh Harbor Abaco as a part of a mass fatality response team in the aftermath of Dorian. He said the pathology team was accompanied by police photographers, other crime scene investigative officers and forensic lab scientists on various occasions. Bridgewater said victims were examined on September 2019 and March 2020. According to Bridgewater, there were 60 sets of remains recovered, including one set of non-human remains. Of the 59 human remains examined, there were 50 adults, 6 children, and 3 uncertain age. 37 were identified as male, according to Bridgewater. 20 were female, and in two cases, sex could not be determined. 28 victims were classified as having likely drowned, and 30 causes of death were classified as undetermined. Bridgewater said there's a need for a national mass fatality plan that incorporates all stakeholders, including police officers, defense force officers, funeral directors, the pathology team, counselors, and others. He said training exercises are needed so that structure and command chain can be established for better organization of the response. The appropriate stakeholders are alerted at the right time, and the provisions are made to properly mobilize the necessary human and physical assets. He added, first responders know how the recovery of bodies should be done. All vital information is appropriately recorded. Proper scene photos are taken prior to the body being removed and correct labeling of body bags is done. Bridgewater said the National Forensic Morgue should be fully staffed and budgeted for by the government and have its own protocols independent of the public hospital's authority. He added that a mobile temporary mortuary unit is also needed, outfitted with examination tables and a temporary body storage refrigeration unit, which can be transported by sea to any island or key in the Bahamas. Reporting Power News Weekend, I'm Jared Higgs.
As additional cruise lines express interest in home porting in the Bahamas, Tourism Minister Dionisio Diagler says the Bahamas has been granted a major opportunity. So we are very um, interested or very excited that home porting is becoming a reality in the Bahamas. It's never happened before. So we're excited that through this adversity of coronavirus, the pandemic, this has created an opportunity for the Bahamas. Mediterranean shipping company cruises and Norwegian Cruise Line have joined the growing list of cruise lines eyeing Nassau for home porting. Tiagler says an agreement with MSC Cruises is likely imminent, while more work remains to be done to court the Norwegian Cruises' interests. If both MSC Cruise and Norwegian Cruise Lines decide to home port in the Bahamas, it would bring a number of cruise lines electing to resume their post-COVID voyages from the Bahamas to four. Royal Caribbean and Crystal Cruises have already announced that they will be home porting here in the Bahamas. Diagler says he believes frustration has driven the cruise companies to operate outside the box. I know the cruise lines are frustrated with the CDC. The CDC is focused elsewhere on rolling out the vaccine and getting the schools operational in the United States. And so the cruise companies have been taken a backseat and are frustrated by that. But it has created an opportunity for the Bahamas. And so we, uh, we anticipate that um, home porting will be substantially economically impactful uh, on the bar. Well, still to come on our news, an historic building gets a woman's touch. A teenager takes on the literary world, plus buzz buzz, bees are taking a business to Exuma on their wings. That's coming up when our news returns. Wake up with Bahamas at sunrise on RTV channel 212. We are live at 6.30 a.m. on Mondays and Fridays with rebroadcast at 8 a.m. on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays and 9 a.m. on Saturdays. Bahamas at Sunrise brings you the best in Bohemian entertainment, current events, politics and more. With us, your hosts, Anastasia Palacios and Phil Simon. Bahamas at Sunrise, the best in Bohemian morning television. You're watching our news. Welcome back. A renewable energy project is in the works for East Grand Bahama, and according to State Finance Minister Quasi Thompson, it's expected to be completed sometime next year. Our Bethany McDermott reports. It's a $4.9 million investment, which State Finance Minister Quasi Thompson says will include numerous capital works throughout various parts of East Grand Bahama, which was nearly decimated by Hurricane Dorian. He explains the plan is to install microgrids across communities in East Grand Bahama. Microgrids will allow this area to be powered by renewable energy while running independently from the main power grid. Solar powered energy will be used to reduce our reliance on imported fossil fuels while simultaneously minimizing the impact on our environment. The microgrids also include an isolation feature which he says will be useful in future natural disasters. Thompson says the East Grand Bahama Renewable Energy Project is part of the reconstruction with resilience in the energy sector in the Bahamas IDB loan program. Thompson further opined that the project will come into phases, with Phase 1 launching later this year. I am advised that Phase 1 begins in September, starting with Sweeting Ski and McLeanstown, which will also fa facilitate power distribution in neighboring Keys and Pelican Point. November will see Phase 2, with installations incurring, occurring in Freetown and in High Rock, which will also provide power to Rocky Creek. Following Dorian, parts of East Grand Bahama were not fully energized until nearly a year later. Thompson says government has also begun a solar street lighting project to install lights on poles in Sweeting Ski, McLeanstown, Pelican Point, High Rock, Freetown and Water Key. Speaking to the Grand Bahama Business Outlook webinar, Thompson said it will also provide jobs for Grand Bahamian. The work is estimated to be completed within two months. Some eight to 10 persons will be directly employed on the project. Additional work will also be provided through subcontractors. It is anticipated that this system will be a model for every Bahamian community. Reporting for Our News, I'm Berthony McDermott. 
Well, a 15-year-old Bahamian girl has done something pretty incredible. She's written a book and now she has started her own publishing company. Our Kyle Joaquin has the story of Lauren Moss. She's your average 15-year-old. I like art. I like making art and music and writing. I love writing. And now the 11th grader at St. Anne's has done something pretty special. She's used her time during the pandemic to not only write a book, but start her own publishing company. The book is called Saviors of Creedon. It's about these twins um, who their world is in the middle of a war. And so um, one day their mom gets taken away by enemy soldiers and they go and try to rescue her. And that's pretty much the basic plot of the book. It's not every day you find a teen interested in reading, much less writing. Lauren shares what drives her to do it. It takes a lot to write a book. I mean, I, I sat down and write, um, started writing and the first couple of chapters, they came easy. But then I, I lost motivation somewhere along the way. And I, I'm actually glad that I actually did push through and finish it because, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of what I did. A pretty incredible feat for a driven young lady, and she encourages her peers to push and get creative as well. I think it's incredibly important for people my age to be involved in, in doing, like, in, in creative things because that, that will last forever. Once you make something, no one can take that away from you. And I believe it's a really positive outlet. And you know, it just, it's fun too. It, <laughs> I mean, you can't go wrong doing, doing something that you love. She had this bit of encouragement for the young and the old. It does not matter how old you are, what anyone tells you, you can, um, you can do whatever you put your mind to. Do not give up halfway through. Even if you start to not like it, Make sure you finish it, because, you know, someone out there might like it. For our news, I'm Kyle Joaquin. Well, the construction field has been a male-dominated field for quite some time, but three Bahamian women are hoping to change that. Construction on government houses underway, and three women are at the pinnacle of reconstructing the historic building. It may be a bit shocking for some to see a woman in a hard hat doing masonry and carpentry, but for Marvette Johnson, Royanne Dorset, and Aaliyah Taylor, it's just another day on the job. Yeah, I feel awesome. At least I get to learn something new, and whatever I learn from here, I could take it from some, take it someplace else. DMs. I like to know blue DMs. You know, it's a challenge. The women are a part of the Telco Enterprises team, carrying out much needed repairs to Government House. They said working in a male dominated construction field is not much different than any other job. When you need a job, a job is like, you know, you need to help your family and then and that better and doing other things, you know. And I respect it. I like this job because it gave me opportunity to grow as a person. And I want to take up carpentry, so I need the experience. Uh, I love the teamwork, the hard work. I just love construction. So what's been the highlight of the job thus far? It was on the roof, for land shingles, and working with the masons and, you know. Basically, it's all around around thing. Yeah. You get to learn carpentry, mason, painting, and basically just learning something new and if you get a house you'll be able to help yourself we are still a few weeks away from the start of the 2021 atlantic hurricane season but officials of the canadian red cross are encouraging abaco and grand bahama residents to seek support rather than suffer silently canadian red cross country delegate brandon mcfarlane says he fears that many bahamians are suffering with post-traumatic stress disorder struggling to cope with twin disasters hurricane dorian and the covid 19 pandemic we proceed to the official start of the hurricane season, I can imagine, well imagine, it's, all, it's PTSD for a number of persons. The memory is still real. And um, we hope that this year will not be certainly a reminder of what transpired in 20, that was 20, um, 2019, September. According to McFarlane, men seem to be one of the ones suffering most, but are usually most apprehensive when considering seeking help. We see this becoming more and more of a, of, of a need. 
particularly for men, surprisingly, as there's a whole issue of risk perception. And um, the reality, when it hits, it's all men who tend to suffer quite a bit. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's very interesting, it's, it's very inter at least that has been my experience, um, largely because we are so, we identify with what is, you know, the tangible components, um, what, you know, you know, what we do for, you know, our livelihoods. And when we lose this, and knowing what that means um, for the family, breadwinners being impacted. Well, when our news comes back from the break, a university professor defends a controversial piece of art. The details, when our news comes back. Wake up with Bahamas at sunrise on RTV channel 212. We are live at 6.30 a.m. on Mondays and Fridays with rebroadcast at 8 a.m. on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays and 9 a.m. on Saturdays. Bahamas at Sunrise brings you the best in Bohemian entertainment, current events, politics and more with us your hosts Anastasia Palacios and Phil Simon. Bahamas at Sunrise, the best in Bohemian morning television. You're watching our news. While many businesses suffered during the pandemic, an Exuma beekeeper says his sales remained steady. The busy beekeeper tells our Jasmine Brown he never regretted following his dreams. Jasmine Brown tells us the details. The sound of bees buzzing has been music to the ears of 30-year-old Bradley Charlton for the past five years. In 2016, Charlton quit his government job and decided to become a beekeeper. My um, lifestyle, it evolved from me seeking healthy alternatives. I used to work with environmental health prior to this, and eventually I was like, this ain't environmentally friendly, not at all. So I aspired to get in the agricultural sector, and I started off on that journey, and I ended up stumbling across beekeeping, and I love it, and it was just, you know, history from there. The little Exuma resident has set up colonies across the island. Bees forage about three miles from wherever their colony is. So I have colonies scattered amongst the island so they don't have to be, you know, like looking hard for resources as opposed to keeping all of my colonies one place. So I probably have about four different locations where I have colonies anywhere from like two to eight hives. According to new agriculturist, bees pollinate about one-sixth of flowering plants globally and about 400 agricultural crop plants. Honeybees are essential for pollination. In 2015, the Exuma Foundation obtained permission from the Ministry of Agriculture to bring honeybees to the island of Exuma in order to foster a cottage industry in the community. Stemming from that, a community of beekeepers was established to support local beekeepers by promoting their products and providing some equipment. Charlton is an active member of that community. You know, the journey has been one where I was just feeling it out at first and as I get more confident and I realize the demand is so high for honey, I just took myself more serious and I just push a little bit harder. Charlton, whose products are sold at local stores and restaurants in Exuma and New Providence, says the demand continues to grow. I have my honey in majority of the major location in Exuma, which would be Exuma Market, Smitty's, and Tracy Bow Plaza. I also um, network with a few restaurants, for example, Blue, and I aspire to reach out to more restaurants. But, you know, a lot of people support me, homeowners and locals. I, I love the enthusiastic, health-seeking people, you know, that seek in the same lifestyle that I am. You know, having that common interest is always inspiring and they really encourage me to move forward and you know, those are the people that realize um, my progress the most, so I always have good times when I'm with them. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. Associate Professor of History at the University of the Bahamas, Dr. Chris Curry, is defending an artist in Grand Bahama whose artwork has recently been taken down and described as racist. The piece, which displayed in, was displayed near Tayano Beach in Freeport, shows a black child sipping from a juice box with the words Caucasian on it. You have an artist who's trying to be um, um, an activist and he's trying to present a particular critique of not just race relations in the Bahamas, but 
uh, the consumer society that we have based on tourism. Curry says he finds it ironic because there are statues around the country that he considers racist, including the Columbus statue that sits on government houses Mount Fitzwilliam. You know, we have statues across the Bahamas of, of persons that are quite racist. Uh, Columbus, uh, no one uh, seems to have an issue with Columbus, uh, but we know that he's in part responsible, at least started the ball rolling for the genocide of the Lucayans. No one has a, a problem with Woods Rogers, though we know that he was actually a slave owner and, and promoted uh, the enslavement of Africans in the Bahamas, though we like to think of him as a hero. And Victoria uh, represents colonialism and racism. But, you know, you don't have people pulling those things down. Curry says the situation demonstrates how Africans in the diaspora have to struggle with the legitimacy of their artwork. There's a double standard with European artwork, right? Like Van Gogh or Picasso. No one is going to question them even when they offer social commentary through their art. But when, when an, an uh, African diasporic artist uh, suggests just in a sublime way uh, a, a critique of race issues and, and a consumer society uh, based on tourism, um, all of a sudden that's considered racist. Well, still to come in our news quote of the week, stay with us. We have programs on commercial in Spanish. Unfortunately, the Bahamas and the rest of the English-speaking Caribbean is lumped in with Latin America, and the giant U.S. networks send us Latin American feed into this region. Oh, so that's what the message means on YouTube and Netflix. Exactly. Restrictions on regional rights impacts all content providers for Cable Bahamas and our regional partners. The fight is about getting English-speaking content into the Caribbean, which we've been very successful doing with HBO, as well as ESPN Caribbean. Now here's a look at some of this week's most memorable quotes. The first quote comes from Prime Minister Dr. Hubert Minnis, expressing confidence that the country will be able to secure enough vaccines for the population. We've been um, continuously, um, aggressively um, searching for vaccines and I'm certain that we will um, find the necessary amount to vaccinate our entire population. I'm concerned about saving lives and livelihoods. I'm more concerned about getting our economy back uh, and running and um, our populace uh, working and um, having more tourists come here and moving the stress on travel and the cost of travel through the Bahamas. This next quote comes from Tourism Minister Dionisio de Aguilar, who praised recently announced relaxed travel restrictions for vaccinated people. Obviously, the current protocols to enter the Bahamas, getting a PCR test five days before, applying for a visa, doing a five-day rapid antigen test five days after you've been here, these are all impediments to travel. These all cause consternation for the traveler. And so as they begin to fall away, we feel the travel interest in the Bahamas will improve and more travelers will begin to come to the Bahamas. And some good news coming for those left unemployed by the COVID-19 pandemic, as Minister of State for Finance announced that the government plans to extend benefit payments to the end of June. The government has agreed to uh, extend the unemployment uh, uh, benefits uh, at least until the of 31st of June, we will be making some further announcements in terms of the way forward with respect to unemployment during the budget exercise. Well, thank you for joining us for our news weekend. On behalf of the entire team, I'm Georgie O'Bain, and we'll see you right back here tomorrow night. On the record with host Jerome Sawyer starts now. <laughs>